Mr. Jumkela, good morning and thank you very much for joining us here in Brussels for the, this interview with Vox Africa. You are the managing director of UNIDO and you are here in Brussels for a workshop on agribusiness and development in Africa uh, in cooperation with the European Union. Uh, my first question is to ask you, for a long time, uh, international institutions uh, are talking about Africa, agribusiness, opportunity, challenge. Uh, so I want to know what is the new uh, the, 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 the new and the good story on this area uh, that we're going to talk about during this workshop. Well, thank you for having me on your program. Uh, first of all, let me say that the context is different. When we have talked about agriculture in Africa, and I use the old word agriculture in Africa, we talk about it when there is a famine in Africa and some disaster and we worry about African food security. What we have done here in this dialogue with the EU Commission is to talk about agribusiness investment in Africa as an opportunity in a context where Africa is growing fast. Okay, so there is a change There's on the... There's a change in mentality that, you know, we can do business in agribusiness in Africa. Africa can be a supplier, a breadbasket for the world, there is a business opportunity, there is a business case to engage. But Africa itself is growing at 6%. Africa itself is attracting investments in other sectors. Africa itself has over 300 million middle class. Africa is fast uh, urbanizing and the population is growing. Could this not be a business opportunity for European agribusiness? But also, should it not be the area we might target to deal with Africa's growing population and growing demand for jobs, youth employment. Do you have That's the context that is different. Excellent. Do, but do you have the competence in Africa to, 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 to work in this uh, new area of agribusiness? Africa has the competence. Africa will need a lot of partnership like every other sector that needs support in Africa. Uh, but it has the competence in the sense that it has the comparative advantage. Africa has over 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. Some parts of Africa have a lot of water uh, they can use for irrigation, so they don't have to depend on rain-fed agriculture. Uh, it's natural. Uh, agriculture is natural to us. What we emphasize here is not just agriculture. We're emphasizing agribusiness, developing the supply chain, value chain, processing and uh, value addition uh, into processed foods. That way you preserve it longer. That way you bring more to the market. That way you can trade. We also emphasize the input supply, fertilizer, machinery, so the general commercialization of African agriculture uh, as a business proposition and also as a way of the world looking at how we're going to feed the, 90, the 9 billion, 9 billion people will have in 2050 globally, 2.2 billion of which will be in Africa itself. But you are not uh, alone uh, to, to, to take care of this uh, opportunity. Also, uh, FAO, talk about that, uh, World Bank, uh, FME and other, other institutions. The thing I want to know if there is a coordination or each institution are doing the same work. Uh, we are all focused on this right now, IFAD, FAO, World Bank, UNIDO, many others. Uh, we, UNIDO, we've been catalytic in sending the agribusiness and agro-industry message beyond agriculture. Uh, we are all collaborating. On my side, um, I, will, we, I did this publication with some colleagues uh, yes, 20, uh, in 2011. And we've been to the World Bank, Asians Fronts de Development, uh, many, uh, over seven, eight countries have asked us to launch this, this publication. It was a way of making the case that we must look at agriculture beyond agriculture, but look at agribusiness supply chain development. So yes, we are all collaborating. You need FAO to look at enhancing uh, farm productivity, uh, 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 seeing how we improve varieties, most of the agronomics, uh, uh, seeing how we, we, we can enhance fertilizer uptake, irrigation, infrastructure. The World Bank is key 
in providing the financing that is going to be needed, but also the technical knowledge. The bank is a powerhouse. We're collaborating with them. But IFAD, uh, my, my brother on Wednesday, uh, can I on Wednesday and I, we've been on TV in Nigeria and other places. Because agri, uh, agribusiness development is tied to rural development. Uh, so IFAD is looking at, again, those supply chains that we advocate and value addition will help to uh, 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 enhance the rural, rural economies. But of course, UNICEF and others are concerned because of nutrition. And so you see it's, um, it's, it's, it's a challenge that requires a holistic approach. But underpinning all of that must be public-private partnership. We're not talking about aid models here. Again, that's what is different in this seminar. You heard me this morning. I said we're talking about business, not charity. We are not talking about a farming. And I said it is in Europe's interest to do this. We, I mean, they, you, showed, you saw the statistics today. In Europe, the food and beverage sector is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, sector here. Over a trillion uh, 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 dollars in revenues every year. That's big. And this is the same story we have for Africa. When you add value, when you develop those supply chains, you create jobs and wealth. And Africa needs to generate 10 million jobs a year. The latest figures we have for 2013, 10 million new jobs a year for the youth. We're saying to Europe and others, agribusiness can have multiple core benefits. Food security, job creation, wealth creation for those rest restless youth that need real jobs and they need to be fed too. So you say you have a, a strong partnership with the European Union. Uh, you are here for this uh, workshop. Uh, one year uh, ago, I do an interview. I did an interview with you uh, from the European Development Days with Mr. Pibax, the Commissioner on Development. Uh, so, do you have something to tell us about success story, about result, about good news that this partnership between UNIDO and uh, European Union? is already brings to Africa on the ground. Yeah. Well, as you know, I'm collaborating with several commissioners here, Commissioner P. Bax, Potochnik in environment, Connie Hedegaard in environment, uh, Vice President Tijani on the trade and development side, and youth employment, uh, Vice President Tijani and I were in Tunisia this year. Uh, a big forum, almost a thousand people with the, with the uh, uh, Prime Minister and the Cabinet and we brought in 300 youth to talk about how we need to create jobs and the kind of skills that will be needed in industry. For me that was a big deal because this is a country coming out of crisis but the difference was Vice President Tijani came with investors and businessmen. He did not come just with bureaucrats or, or experts from universities, no. He brought the businessmen to say, look at Tunisia, there's business opportunity. We're gonna do the same in Nairobi in a few months, also together with the Conference of African uh, Ministers of Industry. But you have to know that the Vice President Tijani and I were in Algeria two years ago with the same thing. So we're consistently taking the message forward, bringing European businessmen to link up with African businessmen. Second. Uh, Commissioner P. Bags and I, we're promoting Africa's case for energy access. You cannot even develop this agribusiness without an energy source. Cheap, affordable, reliable energy. So one of the good things here is we're linking agribusiness and energy. And put, uh, uh, um, Commissioner P. Bags and I were advocating in the world. He was with me this year, uh, 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 sorry, last November in the AU, making the case and also working with the Commissioner for Energy and Infrastructure to see how we can help them attract investments into the projects developed by NEPAD. With Potochnik, we talk about environment and climate change, why? If business as usual continues with climate change, this very agriculture we are talking about in Africa will be dead. We already have projections from uh, the UNFCCC, that's the climate change group, that if business as usual continues, and temperatures continue to rise. Africa will lose 50% of its crop yields. We have some of, the, in other words, we will pay the biggest price for some other people's emissions. Africa only accounts for three, less than 3% of global emissions. But because you and I enjoy the, all the fancy cars and the air conditioning and polluting so much, Africa will pay the price. So you begin to see what we call joined up thinking. When you think agriculture, agribusiness, you must also think about the risk of climate change. This is why we're collective. And now the Commission of Agriculture is joining this and we're forming a team
So see, when we talk about growth and job opportunity and prosperity in Africa, we need to look at it holistically. Agriculture, infrastructure, manufacturing, energy, ah, within the context of the biggest risk in, in, around today, climate change. But what is the priority? Because you have a, a, a huge uh, uh, sector, but you say you, go, you have to, to looking at it as a holistic, yeah. huh? but you have to start with one sector. What is the, the priority sector? Is infrastructure? My brother, the problem we have in Africa, because we've we lost two decades, no growth, a lot of civil wars, a lot of conflicts. Today, we have to do everything. The challenge, at the, same time. at the same time, the challenge for the leaders of Africa is how you sequence your intervention. But you can't leave anyone. If you look at the health indicators, big challenge. Maternal mortality, that part, and infant mortality, part of that is linked to nutrition. That is, part of it is linked to lack of energy. So unfortunately, and this is what African leaders and African people, all of us have to face. When we lose five years fighting, Each time we want to do something, we have to start all over again. In these countries, you go and visit the buildings, the museums, they tell you. Some of them were built 100 years ago, but every generation has been adding. In our case, unfortunately, because of all the political and civil problems we've had, each time we want to do something, the world has moved on, we have to start. But public policy is about good leadership, it is about good governance, where that leadership, is able to sequence policy interventions as a, as a suite of policies, not one single bullet. Prioritization is crucial. It depends on your resource endowment. Uh, some, or some, I always say, some of the African countries are not poor. Not all of us are poor. With the mineral wealth we have today, some of us can invest in a number of these sectors, but whatever you do, enhancing systemic competitiveness through investments in infrastructure, energy, education, not just education, but skills formation, will be crucial and of course we need to create an environment where others would want to invest and our people would want to invest their resources. So creating that enabling conditions requires several interventions unfortunately. As you say, you say uh, finance and uh, to mobilize finance, to mobilize funding is a key issue. Uh, how do you try to do that? How do you do that? As we, we hear that, that in, in Europe, in the West, Let's say in the West, there is a financial crisis, there is an economic crisis. Uh, the, 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 the fund for the uh, cooperation and development aid yeah. are reducing. The, the, the fund for, 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 for to help the, the, the company, the enterprise, are, are reducing in, in the West. But you say in Africa there is some uh, minerals, there is some uh, potential. But how to mobilize that? How do you do that? Well, um, the first thing is working with the governments to create that enabling condition for people to want to invest, their people, but also foreign entities. Uh, it requires good public policy. It requires confidence building, lowering the cost of doing business, how long it takes to clear goods at the ports so factories can operate. If the customs officer is corrupt and delaying everything, they kill the factories. Uh, um, the How long does it take to register a business? If the guy insists on delaying that until he receives some in inducement, you kill business. So lowering the cost of doing business is crucial and every uh, African government is working on this intensely. Uh, second, uh, mobilizing finance. The same time we talk about international financial crisis in Europe, hey, remember, other regions are growing too. Uh, uh, Asia, Brazil, all of them are looking at investment. What I have learned uh, in my almost 25, 30 years now in development, is that capital follows opportunity. Yeah. I have seen investments going to countries that are even at civil war. Yes, I've seen it. So my point is what? There's a lot of capital to go around, but we Africans must create uh, the conditions in our locations that says, ah, this is an, in, an, an address where I can risk capital. At the same time, we should learn what others are doing. It's called leveraging. You know you're going to get revenues of so much over time. Set aside a proportion for investing in the future. Use that to leverage foreign capital to come in. Use that to buy down some of the risk that people perceive in your nation. And so this, whether it's in agriculture or in energy, we're looking at these kinds of innovative financing means and also risk mitigation 
instruments through banks uh, like the European Investment Bank and others to give confidence to people, to companies to come and invest in Africa or elsewhere. I mean, it's no different from what is happening in China. China is attracting a lot of foreign investment, uh, even though they have their own resources. Other Asian countries, the same. We have to do the same. We are part of a global uh, a chain. Those investments bring technology and distribution networks that we need badly. Uh, but again, uh, the leadership has to give that confidence to investors locally, internationally. Whenever you see me emphasizing locally, because sometimes we have a tendency to believe that it's only foreign investment. No. In the case of Nigeria, when they privatized their telecoms, 60% or more of the funding came from Nigeria. We see the same happening in South Africa. When they launched a year and a half ago, what they call SARI, the South African Renewable Energy Initiative, 60% yes. of the financing or more came from South African institutions. Their pension funds, their insurance companies in our countries as well today, but there are many of these so-called institutional investors that are looking for a place to invest money, trillions of dollars sitting still in, in spite of this financial crisis, looking for a place where they can make money to, to also finance their pensions. We must be ready as Africans to look at this new dynamics and create those business models and conditions that can bring that finance. Aid alone cannot do it. I mean, we should, again, in the 21st century, we should be changing our mindset from an aid dependency uh, mode to one in which we're saying, in fact, we set a target. For some of these, our countries, I can name some, that are really are sitting on good mineral wealth. They should set a national date that as of this date, I don't want aid anymore, which means their people and them work hard. It is not arrogance, because it is when you set those targets that in 20 years, I, want to be in, I don't want to be aid dependent. In fact, I want to have my own sovereign fund. Then you lead your nation and convince them to do what is right to create the wealth within the country. Uh, those targets are important now. There was a time, I say this because, again, almost three decades in development. Some countries don't want to be taken off the list of least developed countries. Because when you're on that list, you get aid. That's a mentality to say, stay down. The new mentality, and you see it, from Ghana to Sierra Leone to uh, uh, Tanzania, they're all setting a vision. They want to achieve middle income status. It's a new wave. And so our seminar here with the Commissioner for Agriculture is to say to the European investors, that new thinking is what you should tap into now. We have visionary leaders that are saying we are open for business. So uh, financing is not aid alone. The last question, uh, j just a, a reaction from your side with your experience, as you say, uh, a long time in the development uh, uh, project and, uh, and work. Uh, what do you think about the, the new project of uh, the BRICS to build a, a development bank from Brazil, Russia, China, India and uh, South Africa? Well, I think it's a good idea. I think that it helps to hopefully provide a, a better a, a, a balance in the global financial architecture. We need stability in global markets. We need confidence uh, uh, for capital to move around freely, but also move around well. We need other sources of finance. So I welcome it very much. I, again, my hope is that new bank, if it is formed, also has the, the, the best practices in public policy and support like the World Bank has been giving. So we learn from the successes of the BRICS, because let's face it, China has moved over 200 million people out of poverty in, in almost 30 years. No other nation in history has achieved that. Africans want to learn about that too. The Indians, our brothers in South Africa, Brazil, uh, we want to learn. Brazil is one of the powerhouses for agriculture in the world. But this, this, they know smartly how to use water, how to use energy to promote rural development. We want to learn from that too. Ah, if it comes with their cash, that's good too. Thank you very much, Mr. Yumkela. Thank you for this interview. Thank you. Thanks.